Well, this morning, uh, I'm going to talk to you about kind of a dual purpose message that's going to look a little bit about into what our purpose is, but it's also going to talk about what holds us back from that purpose, which is really uh, insecurity. And, you know, when we, we say this, and I, I say this a lot not to uh, try to convince people, but to remind you and even to remind myself that God created each one of us for a purpose. I, I really believe that. Do you guys believe that this morning? Yes. God created us for a purpose. Now, on the, the flip side of that, that we know that God created us for a purpose, there are so many times where we see people struggling to find that purpose. People who are in church every week, people who come to Bible study, people who come to prayer meetings, people who are good Christians, good fathers, good husbands, wives, mothers, children, they struggle. They're like, but what is my purpose? Maybe I believe what it is today and the next week I find myself again struggling to find my purpose. And when we struggle to find our purpose there's one thing that is clear, and then it's that God was clear about what our purpose is. It's not that he hasn't revealed this to us. The problem is that how we see ourselves, how we think about ourselves, the things we question about ourselves often cloud the picture that God has painted for the purpose of our lives. And, you know, we all have specific purposes and, and one of those is you know there's people that are have a purpose to serve in children's ministry aren't some of you glad today that some other person went to minister to those kids you can say amen to that right I, I'm glad that that's not my purpose there was a, a point there was one time that I actually interviewed at a church to be a family and children's pastor and I'm going to tell you what that was a trick they call it family and children's pastor because they want somebody to think that the job is more than ministering to children. But at the end of the day, that's your job. And I thought, that is not me. I am not a children's pastor. That's not my calling. And I'm thankful for those that are. So that's a specific purpose. You have a specific purpose that maybe that is what you're struggling to find. But I want to tell you, we all have a Big, overarching, general purpose, the thing we were created to do. And this morning I want to look at a few Old Testament kings and try to kind of unpack these questions that we ask about ourselves that the enemy uses to confuse our purpose. And so we'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 10, if you want to turn there. But in 1 Samuel 10, we find this man named Saul. Saul, who is anointed to become king, right? He's had the message delivered to him. Samuel has anointed him. The, the process has started. And if you know anything about Saul, Saul should have been the most confident person on the planet. He should have been just overflowing with confidence in who he was, right? He was physically created well. He was Tall, he was good looking, probably well built. He obviously was a, a good speaker. Like in the natural, Saul had a lot of things going for him. The things that a lot of people strive for, Saul was given, given to him naturally. Okay? On top of that, God has chosen Saul. God has sent a prophet to anoint Saul. And even from there, the people have accepted. Saul. So you got the blessing of God, the anointing of the prophet, the acceptance of people, and you should be just overflowing with confidence, right? I mean, everything is going his way. But if you know the full story of Saul, what you know is that there probably wasn't a more insecure person in the entire word of God than Saul. Saul became so envious of David that it drove him crazy. Literally, he became crazy because of this envy of David. But what you don't think about with Saul, Saul really could have been David. The way we think about David today could have been the way that we thought about Saul 
if he hadn't let his insecurities drive him to the place of giving up what he had. See, insecurity can lead us to hide when we should be stepping out. And this is what we see him doing in verse 21. Again, he'd been told that he was going to be king. He'd been anointed already. The people had accepted him. But in verse 21, it says, When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was chosen. And Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. And when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore, they inquired of the Lord further, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord answered and said, There he is, hidden among the equipment. And so they ran and brought him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen, that there is no one like him among all the people? So all the people shouted and said, Long live the king. This is Saul. I gave this, I preached at the Church of God this morning, and I said, you know, Karina introduced me, and I said, what if Karina would have come up here and said, and to give the message is, Pastor Tim, does anybody know where he's at? You know, and, and, and Clyde would say, he's hiding in the back, in the closet. You know, you'd be like, what is with this guy? Like, it's his time to shine. It's get up there. It's your turn at the platform, and why are you in the back Hiding, And this is what Saul was doing. It was his time to step up, but he's hiding. And what caused him to hide? It's the same thing that causes you and I to retreat and to hide and to go into the back, into the dark and out of the picture. It's that fear and that insecurity and that doubt, maybe even doubt that we can do what God has called us to do, which is where Saul is facing it right now. He's even doubting what God has called us to do. He's insecure. Now, insecurity is not by itself a sin, but it can lead to sinful behavior because it affects the way that we see ourselves, even in the light of what God has for us. It has to do with our self-image. And what does that look like? For many men might be able to sit here this morning and if we went around and been like who in this place has felt insecure there's probably a lot of men that would sit there like this you know what they would be too insecure to even raise their hand that's a fact because there ain't a person in this room that's never been insecure not one of us every single person most confident person you know has been insecure in some situation in their life. We've all faced it, some more than others. But here's a test. How do you know if you're feeling insecure, if this is a battle that you have? For some of us, it could be when you look in the mirror, what do you see? I'm not just talking about am I good looking or not, but like how do you really view yourself? What do you really think of yourself when you look in the mirror that can kind of tell you if you're facing some insecurity and for some of you maybe you're you're good with that right there's a lot of days i don't even look in the mirror i don't have to right i cut my hair short enough so i don't have there you know if i'm trimming my beard i look in the mirror i don't really have to and i'm fine with that i don't have a poor view of myself but then we got stuff like this what about when you walk into a room full of people how do you feel See, sometimes we feel insecure. We start to think about what the people think of us. We start to think about, are we dressed right? Do we look right? Do we say the right things? All these things. What about when you meet new people and, and you go to say something and you say something stupid? You stumble over your words, right? Or you, you choke and you're like, I, I can't even talk because why? Because I'm insecure. I'm afraid I might say the wrong thing and look foolish, and so with Saul right here, with his insecurity, he basically, his entire life, if you read all about Saul, his life shouted one big question of insecurity, and it was this, do people like me? All of his actions, from the opening scene of Saul 
till the end of the scene of Saul is all about, do people like me? What do people think of me? And so here he is in this moment where he's supposed to step up, but instead he hid because he's asking with his actions, do people like me? You remember when David had gone out into battle and he'd killed masses of people for the, for the armies of Israel, right? He had defeated the enemy and the people chanted something. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. You guys remember that? Why did this bother Saul so much? Saul had killed his thousands. He did a great job in that area, right? He had done, killed thousands. This was a great accomplishment. But why did it drive him so crazy? It drove him crazy because every ounce of his life shouted the question, do people like me? And instead of being like, yeah, I did good, congrats to my teammate who did better. Instead of that, he's like, wait, hey, wait a minute. Do people like me? It sounds like they like David. I mean, can, can people like you and David? That's kind of what I would have wanted to say. You know, just because they like David doesn't mean they don't like you, but he's so focused on new people like me that he gets angry and furious about the fact that people think something good of David when they thought something good of him. They hadn't said anything bad about him. But do people like me is what his life shouted. We go a little bit later and look at David's son, Absalom. Absalom's life shouted an entirely different question. When you read all the way through the end of his story, it seems that his life asked the question, do people think I'm important? And there's a difference between do people like me and do they think I'm important, right? A lot of times when you want to look important, you don't really care if people like you. You just want that recognition. Do people think I'm important? Do they think highly of me? Do they see my position? Do they see my authority. When people want to know, do you think I'm important? They are, there's those people that they immediately lead with their title, right? They immediately lead with their credentials. They immediately, you know how many people give me a business card and I have zero interest in their business card? What are those people doing? Unless they're a salesman. If they're not a salesman, they want you to think they're important. You know how many pastors have given me a business card and then they were appalled that I didn't carry my business cards? And I'm like, I'm not that important. I don't need to carry business cards. Like, I don't have anybody to give them to. I put them out here and I hope that if one of you guys wants one, you can take one. You know, I have them for if I do need them. But listen, people will hand those out like, like there's something special, like... Check out my business card. I've even had people tell me about their business cards. Got the rounded edges, matte finish. I almost got the stainless steel ones, but, you know, those are a little pricey, you know. They can get boastful about their business card. Do you think I'm important? I mean, what kind of a life do we live when our, our whole life just shouts, do people think I'm important? They want you to know their position, their authority. When we look down at King Rehoboam, his life was a little bit different. His life, when you read through his story, kind of shouted about, do people respect me? Right? Do people respect me? Do they honor me? Do they think highly of me? It's not just do they like me, but do they think highly of me? You know, there are people who would rather be respected than liked. This is King Rehoboam. And these questions, all three of them, do people like me? Do people think I'm important? Do people respect me? What these questions do is they cloud the picture of what the purpose of our life really is. It clouds the reality of God's purpose. Saul had a clear, crystal clear picture of what his purpose was. Serve God as king. You're chosen, anointed, accepted, but all he was concerned about is do people like me. We know Saul today, reading the whole story, we see Saul as a failed king, right? Everybody sees Saul as a failed king. Anybody who knows the story of Saul, he's a failed king. He's a king who lost his 
mine, and then lost his throne, and then lost his life. Right? That's, that's Saul. Failure. David, on the other hand, we look at his life, and we see a mighty king. We look at David, and we say, David's the goat, right? He's the greatest of all time. David's the man. Everybody loves King David. Now, if we thought about them in today's picture, you take what Saul has done and take what David has done, right? Saul, what we're going to look at here in a moment is Saul uh, did had basically one big error right at the beginning that caused his entire downfall, and it was based on, do people like me? But if we're looking at church today, what did Saul really do? He offered a sacrifice without waiting for Samuel the prophet who was supposed to do it. He overstepped his bounds a little bit, did something he shouldn't have done, but in his mind, it probably wasn't really that bad of a thing. Maybe it was even necessary, but he overstepped. Now, what leader doesn't overstep from time to time, right? I mean, what leader doesn't overstep and they get impatient and they don't want to wait and they're like, you know what, I'll just do that myself and I'll deal with the consequences It'll be better in the long run. Now, David, on the other hand, when we look at the story of David and what he has done and how he has lusted over this woman who's bathing when he's supposed to be off at war anyway, and he sees this woman and wants this woman and calls this woman to his house and sleeps with her and gets her pregnant, tries to manipulate her and her, her husband by tricking the husband into thinking he did it. The husband has more integrity than the king and says, I'm supposed to be with my people. I'm not doing that. I'll sleep outside on the curb, right? He tries to manipulate the situation. Then he ultimately has him murdered so that David could slip in, take his wife, cover up the entire thing. I mean, a huge, huge ordeal. Which one of those two people today do you want to pastor your church? David. The one who's overstepped his bounds and maybe just done something that he shouldn't have done? Or the one who's seduced a woman and slept with her and got her pregnant and got her husband killed? I mean, one of those things I feel like we'd have a lot easier time forgiving and overlooking. Wouldn't we? I mean, wouldn't it be a little bit easier to be like, listen, man. You weren't supposed to do that. Don't do it again. You're going to have to meet with the elders. Right? We've got we to get this figured out. They're going to pray for you, tell you a couple scriptures, knock it off. Don't do that. We're not probably doing that for the guy that's caused all this heartache and all this pain and all this sin and all these things. We'd be like, sir, you really need an intervention. Your life is jacked up, and it's going to be a long time before you're going to be able to serve in leadership, for sure. You're welcome to be here. You ain't serving in leadership. You got to get things right. That's what we would do as people, wouldn't we? But what does God do? Who would God choose out of Saul and David? God chooses David, and, and we got to ask the question, why? Why would God reject Saul and choose David? Saul's life shouted, do people like me? David's life shouted an entirely different question. And it was this. Even in his bad moments, he asked, God, are you pleased with me? Now, there's times where God would answer that and be like, no, sir, I am not pleased with you. Right? We know that when he sends Nathan to share this message with David, this hypothetical situation where this guy would do all these awful things. And Nathan says, what should happen to this guy? And David says, he should be killed, right? That man should be killed. He should lose his life for what he's done. And Nathan says, you are the man, right? You remember that? The, you are the man. And David's like, whoa, okay, right? Repentance. He realized the error of his way. God is certainly not pleased with me, but he repented, and God restored him. Now, when we think about the difference here, what question do we ask with our lives? Is it, are people, do people like me? Is that what we 
ask with every action, every moment of our lives? Or do we ask, is God pleased with me? What's the recording that goes on in your mind in these situations? As you came into church today, as you go to Walmart, as you go to work, you go to school, you're in this crowd of people. What is the question that plays through your mind? Is it, do people like me? And it's not that we don't want people to like us. I'm not saying go out and try to make people not like you. I'm just saying that can't be the purpose of your life. Because you know what? You won't please every person, right? It's not possible. And when we come into church, there's, there's churches that you walk into and people have to ask the question, am I dressed right? Do I talk right? Do I know the language? Do I know the Christian words? Do I know the scriptures? Do I, do I know all those things? Will somebody sit by me? Will somebody talk to me? And you know, there's a lot of people that face that situation, and it's, it's insecurity. And listen, being insecure coming into a place for a first time is completely natural. Like, situationally, it's okay. And I pray that people don't feel that way here. I, I think I've shared this years before, but when me and Christy used to go to Pensacola, when her mom and dad both lived down there, and we would drive from her mom's to her dad's, and we would always go past New Life Deliverance Temple. I wanted to go to that place so bad. I was like, that just sounds like my kind of place. And so uh, I found out it was an all-African-American church. I wanted to go there even more, okay? Uh, when I was a kid, my cousin lived right next door to an African-American church. And for some reason, they had more night services than they did day services. And his room was on that side. And when they would be worshiping, man, the church would be rocking. You couldn't go to sleep. Like, the praise and worship was so loud and pumping from that place. And I was like, I wasn't even saved then. And I, I, I still remember wanting to go over there, wanting to see what that was like. Dude, I'm going to tell you, black church knows how to worship. Amen. Like, I would love to go to one, but that's not what held me back from going to that church. What held me back from going to that church was the fact that I looked on their website and everybody, every picture, suits and dresses. And I was like, I don't have the right stuff to wear there. I would go into that place and they wouldn't reject me because of the color of my skin. They would have rejected me probably because, dude, you can't wear that in here. And maybe they wouldn't. That was my insecurity. right? I could have showed up in whatever I wanted and seen what happened, but I was insecure about what I had to wear. See, oftentimes we're plagued, we're pursued, we're obsessed with these questions that play over and over in our head. And listen, if you struggle with insecurity, welcome to humanity. You're not alone. Right? We all do. Sometimes we won't admit it, but the people that are closest to us know how insecure we really are. But listen, if we live a life of serving God with the goal of pleasing people, if that's what we're doing, it will lead us to a dangerous place because... What will happen is you'll become something you were never meant to become. You will step into areas you were never meant to step into. You will even try to become the Holy Spirit for your own life. You'll begin to try to, uh, try to verify or, or, or quantify what you're doing as though, well, it's okay because this and that, and it's all based around a life of a failed purpose where you're thinking about my purpose is to be liked. As parents, this is where we see this a lot. So many parents want to be their kids' friends. I'm going to tell you, that's not a bad thing to be your kids' friends, but that's not your purpose in their life. Your purpose in their life is to be their parent. Your purpose in their life is to be their mother or their father, right? Everybody else can be their friend. Your purpose is mother and father. Correction, lead them, guide them, love them, right? Teach them. It's, it's a big, big purpose, but I'm going to say that's the problem is when we get off of that purpose of being mother or father and it's all about being friend, guess what? Now who's in control? Kids, 
right? Because we're friends, and I don't want to do anything to upset you. I don't want to do anything that my kid wouldn't like me. You're, now you're not walking in the purpose of being a parent. It's a failed attempt to fulfill a purpose in a way that we shouldn't do it. What about leadership? Whether it be in the church or in the workplace or in the school, wherever you see leaders at, how are leaders who are all about pleasing all the people? They fail. And they fail miserably. Right? Because your job as a leader is not to please. It's to lead. It's literally in the name. You're to lead the people. You show them where to go. You show them how to do it. You don't do what they want. They're followers, right? You're the leaders. If we are all about pleasing people, we will fail. Apply this to our lives as Christians. Why is the church so silent today? Why is the church so silent on social issues today? Because Christians are too worried about pleasing people, right? We're worried about pleasing people, but, but if I say that, somebody will be upset with me. But if you don't say it, how will they know the truth? Right? Our job as Christians is to be Christ-like. Our job as Christians is to follow him, and Jesus upset the cart everywhere that he went. Everywhere that he went, the other leaders did not like him. That's okay to do that. Again, it's not our goal to be unlike unlikable, but our goal is to do what God has called us to do, to step into his purpose. When we lead like this, when we parent like this, when we live a spiritual life like this that's all about, do people like me, it brings compromise to our values. We've got to stop asking, do people like me? Because when you ask that, if you give in to that, you will give up your calling and your purpose just to please the people. And then you know what will happen? Somebody won't like you. Now you threw it away, and somebody doesn't like you anyway. Congratulations. Double loss. Right? I mean, why would we set ourselves up for that? we got to step up, not hide. If people don't like us, so be it. Not to be rude, but I'm, at the end of the day, who cares? Some people just won't like you, and that's okay. You know, as a pastor, I don't make one decision that I make based on will people like me. Because if I start doing that, I'll make a lot of wrong decisions. I tell a lot of people no, and a lot of people don't like it. You know what? Sorry again to be rude, but I don't care. Like, my job is not to make people like me. I hope you do. I don't want you to dislike me, but my job is to please God. To do what he's asked me to do, and in turn, sometimes that causes people to not like you. And that's perfectly okay. Saul was not the first man to hide because of his insecurity. Go back to Genesis chapter 3, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden, and the Lord called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? What is he doing? He's hiding. He's all of a sudden, again, kind of like Saul, probably should have been the most confident person. Here I am. God created me. It's just me, me and my wife, me and my wife and God. This is pretty great. I should be secure. He sins. He becomes insecure. Oh no, <laughs> where can I hide? Where? Listen, there's nothing worse than trying to hide from God. That's the worst. Yeah, I mean, you ever, like, when we used to do, well, we still do lock-ins here. We've done some lock-ins with the kids in the church. But if you were to do a lock-in here, like, there's nowhere in this place that I wouldn't be able to find you. I'm just saying. I'd be able to find you anywhere, Right? And, and I've, I've, I've been to every place in here, so I kind of have an unfair advantage. When we go and we try to hide from God, there's nowhere we can hide where he's not going to find us. He's been in every corner, every crevice. He's been in the attic. He's been everywhere. He knows all of it. But here we see 
Man discovered his sinfulness, and when God called, he hid. It's not the first time when Saul does it. It's our human nature, right? Because it's after the sin. It's after the fall. Now it's our human nature to want to hide and to be insecure. And when Saul was called, he was hiding. Security can lead us to ask, what do people want instead of what does God want? And this is where we see Samuel with the offering in chapter 13 of 1 Samuel, verse 9, 8 and 9. It says, then Saul waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me, and he offered the burnt offering. Right here, Saul has a great opportunity, a great test of leadership. Show the people that you're a man of God. Show the people that you're a leader. Show them that you're called of God, that you're going to do what's right. He's unproven, he's untested, but he's anointed, he's called, but it was not his job to offer the sacrifice. Now he waited seven days. He waited on Samuel. Samuel said seven days, so, you know, Saul set the timer and he's like, in seven days, if you're not back, you know, what am I going to do? Seven days, Samuel's not back. How many of you know it's hard to wait? It's hard to be patient. And Saul had been told, if you wait, I will come and offer it. But what happens is Saul sees the people begin to scatter. I don't know if you caught that in that passage, but it said that the people began to scatter away from him. And so instead of looking to God, he's looking at the people. And he's saying, I know that I'm supposed to wait. I know this is what God wants. I know that it's what is right. But at the same time, the people, like the people are leaving. The people are starting to thin out. Maybe they're thinking, I'm not a good leader. Maybe they don't like me. Where are they going? Why aren't they waiting? And so God said, wait, but the people must have an expectation that he would do something because he's the king. And instead of asking God, what do you want? He continues down the trail of do people like me. He steps out of waiting into obedience, really because of the pressure of the people. The people are leaving. I got to keep the people. I got to retain the people. I got to meet their needs. I got to make them happy. And he did something, church, that he was not enabled to do. He was not empowered to do. He was not anointed to do. He was not told to do. He wasn't supposed to offer the sacrifice. The king didn't do that. The priest or the prophet did it. And because right here he's asking, do people like me? He bows to the pressure of those people. You know, our importance is not determined by the place that we serve. It's not determined by the things that we do. Our importance is determined by are we living a life with fidelity and faithfulness to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Are we willing to live in obscurity? Maybe even serve here in a small town, in a small area, at a small company, doing small things on the grand, in the grand scheme of things, Come to a small church and be part of a small body that we do maybe some small things in the eyes of the world. Are we willing to do those things and be faithful to what God has called us to do regardless of what people think? See, when we serve in little places, sometimes nobody sees us. It can be easy to think, do people like me, when you don't get the response from the people that you really want. Right? There's a lot of little places where people serve that nobody gives them recognition, but I can promise you one thing. I can promise you that when they're serving faithfully in the way that God has called them to, that he looks down from heaven and says, I am pleased with you. Just like he did with Jesus at his baptism. The heavens open up. 
The Spirit descends upon him like a, in the form of a dove. And the Father from heaven says what? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He says, I'm pleased with him. Now, why was the Father pleased with Jesus? Jesus never once did a single thing with the mindset and the heart and the motivation of do people like me. In fact, I would say most of the things that he did, many people didn't like him. He did exactly what the Father told him to do. At this point, when he's baptized, he hasn't really done a lot in his earthly ministry, but he's 30 years old. Now tell me, his mom and his earthly father, they know he's the son of God. His brothers, his sisters, you know they know that he's the son of God. And don't tell me that they didn't ask him to do things that were outside of his purpose growing up. Right? Don't tell me they never asked him to multiply food or to do something crazy. You know that they told him they asked him. They tried to trick him, and he probably could have been like, you know what, I want my family to like me. I guess I'll do it. No, he held fast to what is the Father's purpose for me. He didn't live a life of trying to please people. He lived a life of trying to please God. And God in his mercy, listen, not because of the gifts and the talents that you have, but in his mercy, he is pleased with us because God can have anybody do what he's called you to do. He can have anybody do what he's called me to do. Could be one of you guys. One of you guys could be up here preaching today instead of me. I would have, I would have said no, you know, 10 years ago too. But he can have any person do what he's called us to do. But in his mercy, he looks down upon us and says, thank you, faithful child. I am pleased. See, insecurity can drive us to ask what do people want instead of what does God want. Leads us to assume roles we are never meant to take on. And this is what Saul does. He offers up this burnt offering. Now, what happens to Saul is exactly what would happen to me if I was to let up, light up this burnt offering. In verse 8, it says, now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? This would have been me. As soon as I got done rubbing those sticks together, got that fire going, offering catches on. Of course, Samuel's going to show up now. Like, I couldn't have waited five more minutes. I would do it right before it was too late. And here Samuel shows up. And what it says is that Saul went out to greet him. You know why Saul went out to greet him? What does Saul want? He wants people to like him. He just did something that's going to make Samuel mad. And so he's like, you know what? I'm going to meet Samuel outside at his car. I'm going to sweet talk Samuel on the way in. Hey, Sam, how's it going, buddy? Glad you're back. I, you said seven days. Sure enough, here you are. Uh, we've got a little problem inside. I love you, Sam. You're a great guy. I'm glad you're here. You know, you need coffee? We do have a small problem inside. And he's like, Sam was like, what have you done? And then when Saul goes on to explain himself, and he's kind of like, well, but what I saw and what I thought and, and, and what I felt and, you know, I, I did this for God, right? I mean, you know, so what if I did what I shouldn't have done? You know, you look at what I saw, look at what I thought, look at what I felt. You weren't here. What is he doing? Saul spiritualizes his disobedience. But Lord, I really did it for you, right? I didn't want to go into battle without the offering. And I, I figured if it's, I, I need to do it now if Samuel's not on time. Listen, if you disobey God because of your insecurity, it doesn't make it okay. You can't spiritualize your disobedience. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Church, we've got to guard our heart. That's what we think, what we see, what we feel. All those things that, Paul, that Saul used to be able to explain himself. We're to guard those things because they will determine the course of our life. 
If we bow to them, and it's exactly what he did, the enemy will continue to bombard us with the lies, with the questions of, do people like me? Do they think I'm important? Do they respect me? And these questions will cause us to retreat. They'll cause us to go into a place of controlling, of guarding our position, of trying to be something we weren't meant to be, act like somebody we weren't meant to be like, to step into positions we weren't anointed to do, but the people expect it from us. That's a miserable place to be. We've got to step into our calling, our purpose, our passion of God. Are you pleased with me? I think today God wants to put that question at rest that's in your mind. Do people like me? At the end of the day, yes, it matters if people like you, but it's not primary. It's not primary. If that's what you're living to do, if you're a people pleaser, man, I believe today that God's going to break that off of you in Jesus' name because we're not called to be people pleasers. We're called to be Jesus pleasers. We really are. We really are. We need to ask, Lord, are you pleased with me? Because listen, that is your purpose as a child of God. I just want to make it that simple. What is my purpose as a child of God? To please God. That's it. To please Him. To live for Him. To follow Christ. To listen to the Spirit. All those things that lead us to pleasing Him. 2 Corinthians 5.9 says, Therefore, if we make it our aim whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. This has got to be our aim. It's got to be what we're shooting for, right? My aim, my focus, my attention is on pleasing God and him alone. And when we start to operate out of that mode, it enables us to let loose, to not have control, to... Uh, not have the approval of every person around us to be able to weather the storm of criticism in our life, to be able to go to little places without affecting our dignity and your worth. Because listen, your worth is not wrapped up in whether people like you or how many people you have under you or how many people you have following you it's wrapped up in your obedience to Christ which is pleasing to God and it relates to you being joyful because you serve out of the joy of King Jesus not out of the need to please people around you Romans 8:8 8, 8 says so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God those that are in the flesh cannot please God. What is in the flesh? It's these questions that play through our mind. Do people like me? Do they think I'm important? Do people respect me? See, these are questions to the flesh because they appeal to our soul. They appeal to our mind, our will, our emotions. How do people feel about me? What do I think about what people think about me. These things lead us to disappointment. Not only do they lead to disappointment, but eventually, if that's all we think about, they'll break us down. It'll break us down. But there's a question that appeals to the Spirit, and it's, God, are you pleased with me? And where there's the big difference right here, church, is that there's something that happens when we ask the question, God, are you pleased with me? This question sets our heart on the right mark. And instead of being one that leads to disappointment and breaking us down, the Spirit encourages us and builds us up. And so the question today is, what are you asking? What are you asking with your life? What are those things that concern you, that keep you up at night? Are they... Do people like me, or are they, is God pleased with me? If you're asking if God's pleased with you, it's not going to keep you up all night. It's going to give you peace and rest. It may draw you to a place of repentance. You may be up one night, right? But if you're willing to repent, 
brings you back to that place of peace and rest. So what are we asking? Would you stand with me? Father, we thank you and praise you this morning for your faithfulness, for your goodness. God, we thank you for the word of God. Lord, we thank you for your spirit, for your presence. God, we thank you that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid the penalty for our sins. That if we would believe in him, we believe in him, confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that you raised him from the dead, that we shall be saved. Lord, that we believe that we shall have eternal life, that Jesus said, and this is eternal life, that they know you and the one whom you have sent, which is Jesus. That today we can have that. That it's a payment that was paid in full for all who would receive it. And I pray for any who have not received that yet, today would be the day that they would consider the cost. That they would realize that none of us are good. That none of us can do it on our own. That there's no other path to heaven, but there's no other path to peace. There's no other path to rest. There's no other path to unending joy. There's no other path to fulfillment in our purpose than to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. God, I pray for those today that are stuck in that place of people pleasing, wondering if people like them that today you would break us free from that bondage, that you'd bring us to a place of our heart crying out, God, are you pleased with me? Because God, if we live a life that is pleasing to you, it'll be a life of doing the right things instead of the wrong things. If we live a life that is pleasing to you, it'll be a life that will be fulfilling and, and not a place that leaves us wondering and, and searching for our purpose any longer. Lord, will you do what only you can do? And as we worship Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who was and is and is to come, Lord, as we worship you, will your spirit do your perfect work in each of our hearts and lives and draw us close to you. Lord, will you help us to live that life where you can say, this is my child in whom I'm well pleased. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.